we're going to make the case that there are bad plumbers, you know, and, and, and they don't know what they're doing, and so, so they don't have any skill, or maybe they're worse than not skilled. They make things worse, because that's worse than just not skilled. And then you could say, well, maybe they lie to you when, when they deal with you, and maybe they overcharge you, and maybe they don't treat their employees very well, you know, and maybe they're not good to live with at home either. Who the hell knows? But they're not good plumbers. And so we're going to say that just in the plumbing domain, which is an important domain, skill matters, right? That seems reasonable. And then we might say the same thing about, well, what? Probably matters in law. Like, if you ever need a lawyer, I would recommend that you get a good one. Because if you get a bad one, it's going to cost you a lot more than if you get a good one. Like, like everything. And, you know, there are good teachers and not so good teachers. And there are good massage therapists. And there are good nurses. And there are horrible nurses. And there are great surgeons. And then there are surgeons that will definitely kill you. You know? And you, you want to go to one that won't kill you. That's the... That's the and you, you'd assume difference in skill. You know, and whatever your occupation is, you know bloody well. Maybe you're a short order cook at a diner, and like some short order cooks can whip up a pretty damn decent breakfast in three or four minutes, and you're pretty bloody happy to sit there and eat it. And other short order cooks can produce some god awful mess of, of burnt eggs and wretched toast and rancid bacon and orange juice that's like had a crayon dipped in it for the color, and with, with a really ornery. Uh, waitress and coffee that's been cooking since like 1953 and there's a that's a big difference in short order cooks there's qualitative difference in skill okay and so one of the things we might point out is that part of the reason that we have hierarchies in the West is because people actually differ in skill not power skill some people are better at whatever it is they're supposed to be doing than other people, and we think that what they're supposed to be doing is important so that it matters that they're better at it. And we're, what are we going to do? We're going to deny that skill plays a role? All the evidence suggests that it does. Like if you look at what predicts long-term success from a psychological perspective in a given occupation, conscientiousness is the best personality predictor. And conscientious people are dutiful and hardworking, and they have integrity, and they do what they say they're going to do. And so that's the best predictor, second best predictor, and the best predictor is intelligence. And so it looks like in a relatively complicated occupation, if you're going to be successful in a Western culture, the best predictors of your success is whether you're intelligent, skilled, and conscientious. And that's pretty good. Like, how else would you want it to be if you're going to set it up? And it isn't power, because agreeableness is another dimension. You can be disagreeable. Men are more disagreeable than women, by the way. And if our society was fundamentally based on power, then the most disagreeable people would be the most successful. And they're not. They're the ones that are most likely to be in prison. So, so that evidence just doesn't support that. And then, you know, the other thing is, is you don't have, you imagine, well, our society is fundamentally an oppressive patriarchy, and everything's based on power. It's like, okay, so you need a plumber, and so what you do is you go out in the street, or maybe you don't, maybe you cower at home, and these like gangs of plumbers come to your house, and they're armed to the damn teeth with their pipes, and they say, look, I don't know whether you need like some plumbing work done or not, but maybe we'll come in here and break a few things so that, so that you do need it, but even if we're not going to do that, it's like, we're the plumbers that are going to take you out unless you call us. And so the next time the toilet overflows, man, here's the number and you better put it on your fridge. Or there's going to be hell to pay. Or, you know, the same is the case of like gang affiliated massage therapists. Exactly the same thing. Tattooed to the hilt, right? Armed to the teeth. And, and roaming the streets, making bloody sure that if you have a stiff neck, that the most powerful massage therapist is the one that you're going to call first. You know, it's complete bloody rubbish. It's absolutely not the case. Now, it is the case that even in a hierarchy that's functional, the thing can go sideways, and it does. You know, you get companies that get too big, they start to get corrupt. People who play politics and who are good at manipulating start to rise up the hierarchy. The, the, the structure stops performing its function, its useful function in the way that it should. It starts to degenerate, but generally then it dies. 
you know, like the typical Fortune 500 company only lasts 30 years, and the typical family fortune only three generations. It's not that easy to keep a functional enterprise going. You have to be awake. And so, no, it's not an oppressive patriarchy, our culture. That's wrong. It's based on competence, fundamentally. Imperfect as that is, it's not like we don't make hiring mistakes. It, it's not like there aren't people who are foolish and blind and hire and fire based on attributes that have nothing to do with competence. But that's a sign of the deterioration of the system and the corruption of the system and not an indication of its fundamental function. And it's also the case that, and this is partly what I tried to outline in rule one, which is pretty much the rule we're going to discuss today. Um, Part of your goal, if you want to take your place in the hierarchy properly, is to be a good person. And that was the argument I was trying to make in the chapter. Not that you're supposed to be like the most brutal crustacean on the block, you know? It's so foolish. It was Kathy Newman, I think, that asked me in, in, the, in, in the UK. So you're saying that human society should be organized along the lines of lobsters. It's like, look, lady, if you're gonna, if you're gonna insult someone, you might want to try accusing them of something, of believing something that someone somewhere believed at least once in the entire history of the human race, and not that. Yes, absolutely, lobsters for everyone. You know, that's how, how, what I was trying to make the case was that we have this very old system in our nervous systems, which is very old, which keeps track of where we are in hierarchies and that regulates our emotions because of it, because it's really important to you and you and you and you. If you're not completely bloody psychopathic, that you have a place in a social hierarchy and that you're admired and respected and valued by other people. And it's so important that, that the neurochemical system that keeps track of that regulates your other emotions so that if you're low on the totem pole because, well, for whatever the reason happens to be, sometimes you deserve it, sometimes it's accidental, sometimes you've been hurt. There's lots of ways that, 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 that this can happen. Your serotonin levels plummet like a defeated lobster, and then you, you feel way more negative emotion about everything and way less positive emotion about everything. And that's absolutely dreadful. Like, it's, it's, that's clinical depression, and it's a terrible, terrible condition. And so it's absolutely crucial that you maintain a tenable position in a hierarchy, and not a one of power, but one of competence. And at least even if you're not in a position that's tenable, you're moving upward towards one that's tenable, because that at least gives you hope. You know, because maybe you're young and useless, and you don't know what the hell you're doing. You're just getting started. And so you're low man on the totem pole, but it's not like you're stuck there forever. You do some decent work. I had some kid tell me the other day, it was really nice. It was just last night. It was at a comedy show I went to here, and um, a lot of the comedians knew us. Dave, Dave Rubin and I went in there, and so a lot of them knew us, which was quite interesting. And one of them said, God, you know, I was in a rough shape two years ago. I was just getting married. I just got married, and I was nihilistic as hell and depressed and bitter, and things weren't going well for me at all. And, uh, I, and I was unemployed, and one of my friends got me a job. And he said, I didn't really like the bloody job. I didn't want to have the job. And I was kind of dragging my ass to the work and not doing it well. And I listened to one of your lectures, and it said, look, if you haven't got anything going for you, but you have a job, don't quit your job. Whether you hate it or not, it's like, man, that's what you're hanging on to the edge of the world with your fingertips, you know? Don't let go. Oh, if you can find a better job, okay, fine. But you don't just quit, because then what? You're done. And he, and he said, and another thing that I had mentioned was, uh, why don't you just try to work as hard as you can at your damn job for like six weeks, right? All flat out. You know, if you work 10% longer hours, you make 40% more money. That's something worth thinking about. You know, you've got a job. Maybe you show up 15 minutes early and you leave 15 minutes late. You know, and you actually work and your boss notices because he would probably notice and then maybe someone's going to get promoted and maybe it'll be you because something's going to tilt the scales and that little extra bit of work done without cynicism and resentment might be enough. 
Well, he said he started at 21 bucks an hour, and in six weeks, he was making $37 an hour. And it's not a king's ransom, man, but it's a hell of a lot more than zero, and it's quite a lot more than 21. He said his life had turned around substantially because he learned if he put some damn effort into it. And I'm not trying to be Joe Optimist here. Like, I know that people hit runs of bad luck and that things can take you out of life, right? Unfortunate illnesses and... and, and, and betrayal and like there's no shortage of randomness and horror that can wipe you out even if you're doing your best but you don't have a better bloody plan than to do your best and it tends to work a lot better than you think and what's so interesting about the hierarchies that people set up is that that's how they're set up they're not set up on power they're set up on reciprocity and skill and trust not always you know, and if you're in a job where you work hard and you're a good guy and, and you're doing your best and your boss is a bloody tyrant and you, you never get a break, it's like, okay, fine. You're, you're, you're in a Foucault world. Get the hell out of it, you know? You get your resume set up, write your CV, fill in the educational gaps that you, can ha that you have, send out your 25 resumes a day and prepare to make a lateral move because you're in a bad place. But almost everywhere, and this has certainly been the case virtually everywhere I've worked, and I've had like 50 jobs, you know, if you go above and beyond the call of duty in a, and wake an intelligent way, interpersonally, socially, with regards to the diligence of your work, with regards to the truth of your attitude and your courage and all of that, that will work. And you know, if you try it for a year and it doesn't work, then go somewhere else, because you can, right? You're free, I mean, it's not easy. You, you can't just walk out the door and instantly find another job, but you're not enslaved. You could make a move. You could even decide that you're gonna make a move and double your salary. You know, it's not a bad goal, and it's certainly a possibility. It's like, it isn't hierarchy. It's ethics that determines success in a functional society. It's ethics that determines success, not power. The rest of it's a bloody lie. And that doesn't mean that all our systems are perfectly ethical. You know, you gotta be awake. If you're in a system, there's gonna be some corruption in it. Part of what you're supposed to do is keep your damn eyes open for the corruption and your mouth speaking truth. So when the corruption starts to take root, you object to it so the whole damn system doesn't turn into a pathological power play. And that's part of your ethical responsibility as a conscious being, an ethical being, a religious being for that matter, and a citizen. You know, and, and you're charged with that. That's why, you're, that's why you vote. That's why you're the cornerstone of your state, man. You're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the, what would you call it? You're the, you're the wellspring of the ethical actions that replenish the dying world. That's what you are. And if you, if you act, that's really, that's what you are. And if you act that out properly, then things work. And that's why that's always been described as ethical behavior. It's not because you're supposed to be good. You know, and being good isn't that easy anyways. And it certainly doesn't mean being nice and harmless. It's not an easy thing to be good. You have to be tough as a damn boot to be good. Because you have to stand your ground when you need to stand your ground. And you have to be able to say no when it's time to say no. And you have to mean it. And so then you have to think and plan strategically so that when you're going to say no, you can mean it and it will stick. You know, and that takes a certain amount of, that takes a certain amount of integrated malevolence, I would say. And, and once it's integrated, it's not malevolence, it's strength. It's, it's strength of character. It's the ability to stand your ground. And you have to cultivate that. And you cultivate that at least in part by telling the truth. And so you take your place in the world as a decent person and as a decent citizen. And then and you play the hierarchical game properly. And that is to stand up straight with your shoulders back. It's like the world's an onslaught. You've got the tyranny of culture to deal with. You've got the catastrophe of nature. You've got your own damn malevolence and ignorance, right? All coming at you, plus the incredible, complicated, indeterminate potential of the future. That's all coming at you, and it's all your responsibility, and you can cringe away from it and be afraid of it and be victimized by it and be bitter and cynical about it. And, and no wonder, because it can be painful. Or you can turn around and you can say, man, bring it on because there's more to me than there is to the catastrophe. And this is what I discovered from looking at what I looked at. I looked at the darkest things I could look at, really, for 30 years. I was really a lot of fun to be around, I can tell you. 
I looked at the darkest things that I could think of, right? Not only what happened in Auschwitz and what happened in the Gulag, but, but personal issues, you know? It's like I wasn't so much interested in the totalitarians as a group. I was interested in the people who undertook the terrible acts that the totalitarians required. You know, the people who, I was just rereading Ordinary Men, and it was a story about a police battalion in Poland that trained ordinary policemen to take naked pregnant women out into the fields and, sh and, and, and shoot them in the back of the head. It takes a lot of training, by the way, before you can bring yourself to do that. And you aren't the same person by the end of it. It's pretty goddamn horrific. You know, and I was trying to figure out what would it be like to be that person? Because we are that person. And then what would it be like to not be that person? right, to refuse to do that, to not participate in that, you know, and, and what I discovered by making that totalitarian proclivity personal was that there was, there's more to us than there is to the horror as nature is, bent on our destruction, bad as culture is, tyrannical and bloody, back as far as you can look, as malevolent as you are in, in the darkest part of your heart, and that's plenty malevolent, the, the, the possibility that's within you that can well up the, the courage and the truth and the ability and the skill and, and, the, and the willingness to set things right, if you are willing to set them right, is more powerful than all of that. And so it's so interesting. It was, it was proof for me of an old saying I, I read from Carl Jung. It's an alchemical motif in Sterquilinus Inventor, which is what you most want to be found will be found where you least want to look, essentially. And it's so interesting because it means that if you're willing to turn around and to stand up, say, and stand up straight and face the darkness, like fully what you discover at the darkest heart is the brightest light and not something that's so much worth discovering because there's going to be terrible darkness in your life and it's going to make you cynical and bitter and it could easily be that you're just not looking at it enough because if you looked at it enough and you didn't shy away and you brought everything you had to bear on it you'd find that there was more to you than there was to the horror you know, I watched my father-in-law. I'll end with this. And you know, you don't know, eh? Because you're not bringing your A game to the table with all that cynicism and bitterness and resentment and willful blindness and avoidance. Maybe you're playing at 60%. It's not good enough because there's too much of what's bad for 60% to be good enough. It's like you need 90% or 95% or 100%. My... When, when, when about 15, 20 years ago, my mother-in-law developed um, pre, pre, frontal temporal dementia, which I wouldn't recommend. You know, it's one of those degenerative neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. And those bloody things are, like they're in the top echelon of awful. You know, you watch a person deteriorate before your eyes. It's a lengthy, lengthy death. And, and it was slow. And her husband, he, was, he lived in this little town that I grew up in, about 3,000 people. And he was quite a character, man. Everybody knew him. Uh, I bought him a Foghorn Leghorn t-shirt once. Because that's kind of what he was like. He was loud and sort of bombastic. But he stood up straight, I can tell you. And he played the fool a little bit, mostly for the amusement of people. But he was no damn fool. And, and I always admired him and liked him. And, and the feeling was, was mutual, thank God, since I married his daughter. And, uh, you know... He drank a lot with his crazy friends up in northern Alberta, and he wasn't at home a lot because he was working a lot. And, and, you know, he was kind of a party animal about town, but a good businessman and a good man. And, and then his wife got sick, and they moved to another town. And, you know, he took care of her for like 15 years. It was unbelievable as she deteriorated, you know, and she got more desperate to have him around, and her love for him never, never went away, even, in, even as she lost herself almost completely, she would always light up when, when he came into the room, you know, and he took care of her right till within weeks of her death. He had to finally put her in an old folks home because he was no longer strong enough to lift her up from the chair. And we interacted with him a lot. 
you know, because we were trying to help them figure out how to cope. And we had signs put up in the house, electronic signs that would tell her when, she, when he was leaving so that she would know where she, he went. And we had recordings in the bathroom so that she knew what to do when she went into the bathroom. And we tried to do everything we could to not make this absolutely bloody, atrocious experience complete hell. And he participated the whole way. You know, and it was really something to see. It was really... I, I, I left me with a tremendous sense of admiration for him, but, but not just for him, but for people who can do that. You know, and if, if, if there was a new decline, he took it on, and, and he didn't complain about it. He tried to do what he could, you know, and, and like it was no picnic, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't hell. And, and then we were all gathered around the deathbed, her mother's, my, my wife's mother's deathbed, and the, the family was there, and they got along pretty well, you know, and, her sister's a palliative care nurse, and the other one's a pharmacy a pharmacist. And none of them are particularly afraid of, of illness and death. You know, they're a pretty tough group. And so, you know, they made sure their mother's lips were wet while she was no longer eating or drinking and, and tried to make her comfortable. And they're around the deathbed, and they were kind of getting along, you know. It wasn't family feud at mother's death time. And that was kind of nice. And, and she died, and, and that was that. And, but it wasn't just that, because... The fact that the family had coped with it well and nobly and honorably, I would say, brought them together. They were closer afterwards than they were before. And they all had more respect for their father. And then in the old, in the old folks' home, he met another woman who had a husband there who had Alzheimer's. And they got to know each other, you know. And he died after a while and she died after a while. And then a few months later, they started going out. And then eventually they had a relationship and now they live together. And so he gained something. Like it wasn't that he replaced what he lost. You know what I mean? Because he still has pictures of his, of his wife up in his house. And she was the love of his life. And that's not going away. But, you know... His family respected him more, and everybody pulled together more, and it wasn't hell at the deathbed, it was just tragedy. And the family pulled together more. And that was a good example of, of how you can extract at least a certain amount of light out of, what, out, of, out of what's dark, even at a personal level. And it's worth asking yourself. It's like, drop what you're doing that's foolish, that you know is foolish. And pick an aim that's worthwhile, you know, to make things better for yourself, like you're worth taking care of, like you're worth something, you know, and to surround yourself with people who, who believe the same and who are, what, rejoicing in your accomplishments and unhappy when you fail, right? And you're comparing yourself to your accomplishments of yesterday and not to someone else's today so that you're not jealous and bitter. And you put your own house in order so that you're not cursing the world when some of its disarray might be your fault. And you're trying to pursue something meaningful and you're doing your best to tell the truth and all of that. And then you see what happens. Who the hell are you? You know, you think you're a miracle of some bloody bizarre sort. We've been around for three and a half billion years. You know, every single one of your relatives propagated successfully. And here you are against all possible odds in this, in this world of hell in some sense and, 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 and bitterness and, 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 and tyranny and malevolence. And yet God only knows what's inside you, this capacity for consciousness, the capacity to confront potential and to turn it into something good. That's us, man. That's the Western story. That's the individual as the cornerstone of the state. That's our responsibility. And it really is who we are. And so we need to know that and we need to remember it and we need to act it out. And then maybe we can see what we can do about it, you know? And see how good we could make things. And maybe that would be the purpose of your damn life, right? Not to be happy. It's like there's problems to be solved. Be happy after you solve the goddamn things, right? So I learned, because I looked at dark things, that I learned that the light was more powerful than the darkness as far as that I was concerned, and that people were re capable, each of us, of remarkable things, and that we need to know that that's what we are. We're this consciousness that confronts potential with all its catastrophe, 
That's what we are. That's what makes us in the image of God. That's what gives us our intrinsic value. And that idea that we have intrinsic value, that's the bedrock presupposition of our state. We're going to question that, or we're going to live it out. Better to live it out. Find out who you are.